<laughs> no, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Janet, for inviting me back. It's so great to be with you and everyone. And for those who may not realize, I'm Dr. Michael Chisner. I'm a practicing cardiologist. I'm professor of medicine and director of medical education at Broward Health, which is one of the largest not-for-profit healthcare systems in the nation. It's based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida and Broward County. And I've long been involved in education and training. I love to teach all the medical students, the residents, the fellows, the nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, all healthcare professionals for a long time. My passion for teaching is especially in clinical cardiology, emphasizing the importance of bedside clinical skills. And this passion was ignited in me and inspired in me by a very wonderful mentor of mine in my training program named Proctor Harvey. Dr. Harvey emphasized the importance of using one's own senses and a stethoscope and the ability to take those senses and a stethoscope to make rapid, accurate, and cost-effective diagnoses each and every day in the hospital setting, at the bedside, or in the office or the clinic without having to be so over-reliant and over-dependent on all the wonderful technological advances we have today in our hospitals, literally at the push of a button. He felt that not that the technology wasn't wonderful, but the importance of a careful clinical history and physical examination is paramount to being a clinician. And it entrusts the patient with that trust and confidence and that bond that's so important for the privileged and sacred doctor-patient relationship. So. Well, that's quite, quite a nugget there for everybody. Um, so basically what's beautiful about that is we're getting knowledge that's been handed down um, from Dr. Proctor Harvey through Dr. Chisner. And now hopefully we'll all be little uh, disciples of <laughs> Dr. Chisner carrying on your, your legacy and message. But the really great thing you guys about Dr. Chisner that I, I wanna share with you is that um, you know, not only does he take care of the heart, but he has heart. And, and what I mean when I say that is that um, he 100% not only cares about his patients, but cares about us and carrying on the beautiful part of medicine, which is the human element, right? Because that's so important. The human element's important. He'll be kind of sprinkling that through, I'm sure, with some stories, but also getting back to the basics and getting back to the roots of what's important, which is actually listening to our patient because the patient will tell us what's wrong if we just know how to listen. And of course, doing a good exam. And so Dr. Chisner, I was hoping you could share with folks a little bit about your five finger approach. Well, thank you again so much, Jenny. Um, as I'm listening to you talk to everyone, I think the most important thing we need to understand even before we start that, is that despite all the things we read or hear about the problems that healthcare is faced with, and God knows we're faced with so much, especially in this COVID era, the essence of why we all got involved in medicine has never changed with the passage of time, has it? I know it's true for you. I know it's true for everyone listening. Otherwise, they wouldn't even be here today. And that's burning desire to help people in need of care, isn't it? To me, there is no greater opportunity, no greater responsibility or calling than to be a physician, a healer, or a nurse. The evolution of medicine and nursing may try to compel us to force ourselves into becoming much more introspective about our profession, about our goals, about our community. But in spite of the technology that we have today, nothing is as wonderful as the human heart, the human mind, and the human spirit when it's put to use in the service and the care of others. After all, medicine and nursing are serving professions. They exist not for their own sake, but they exist for the benefit and care of others. Your presence here today, Jenny, and all the people listening in speaks to your and their dedication and commitment. And that I applaud and salute each and every one of you. I was fortunate, very fortunate. My exposure to teaching clinical cardiology, emphasizing the importance of clinical skills came in my fellowship training with Dr. Proctor Harvey. Dr. Harvey was a legendary cardiologist, one of the greatest bedside clinician teachers that ever lived. And he instilled in us the idea that if we use our own wits and senses and the basics of what he termed was a five finger approach to the patient, we can derive all we need to know about a patient. What are the five fingers? The history, the thumb, the most important finger of all, the patient's story. As you just said, Jen, listen to your patient. They will give you the diagnosis. 
As you know, that came from Sir William Osler, the father of modern bedside medicine. The next finger of importance in that order, the physical examination. But we have to know the patient's story. After all, the word story is part of history. If we can extract a meaningful history and understand what the patient is truly trying to tell us and give them the attention and time to understand what that history is, we then know what we have to look for, feel for, and listen for on inspection, palpation, and auscultation when we examine a patient. And if we can do just those two alone, skillful use of those two, low technology, leads to intelligent, cost-effective use of high technology. Hands before scans. Hmm. After the history and physical comes a very simple, wonderful tool that Jennifer teaches and preaches and teaches so beautifully and so well for such a long time now that you're all aware of, which is the electrocardiogram. And all the clues to diagnosis and the hard things to find not to miss and all the clues that'll make you wonderful clinicians on the electrocardiogram. Is your patient in the throes of a STEMI, a heart attack, and you need to know to get the person right to the cath lab, door to balloon time, 90 minutes, or transfer to a PCI capable hospital for percutaneous coronary intervention within 120 minutes or not? Or is the patient in the throes of a syncopal episode and has complete heart block and needs a pacemaker, or do they just have a neurological event in atrial fibrillation? Some clue that Jenny's gonna teach you. Fourth finger, often forgotten to look at, maybe not the report, is the chest x-ray, the primitive radiographic procedure. And then purposely relegated to the pinky is the cornucopia, the myriad elaborate and expensive non-invasive and invasive tests that we have today, literally at the push of a button. But we need to order them selectively, appropriately, and cost-effectively. Remember, every patient does not need every test. Again, skillful use of low technology, high touch, the history, the physical, leads to intelligent, cost-effective use of high technology, hands before scans. Awesome, as usual. There's a couple of folks saying they wanna jot this down. <laughs> Even better, he has a book, um, which I'll show you at the end, um, that has all these things and more. So um, I'm going to see if I can get our um, PowerPoint to come up. But while I'm getting that to come up, if you could also share with us, I wanted to ask you one burning question. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you, because I know we have a lot of new folks, if you could tell our new folks one piece of advice and, and maybe something similar to what you would have told your younger self, the younger version of yourself when you were first starting, something that you know now that you wish you would have known? Could you share any pearls with us? Well, I think the most important take home message that my own students will verify even today, we heard from every single patient that came into my office to see us. They all want to be connected to their doctor or their nurse. You know, the rewards of rediscovering the art of medicine are many. In particular, the feeling of tremendous satisfaction, not only at arriving at a rapid, accurate, and cost-effective cardiac diagnosis with your own wits and senses, what we in the medical profession refer to as not only the art, but the fun of medicine, but in terms of what it will add to, it will also add to establishing that bond with your patient, the so-called laying on of hands that will help to foster the close rapport, the trust, and the confidence that is so important to the privileged and sacred doctor or nurse-patient relationship. For as it is said, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And especially now, as we continue to move into the 21st century, when the American healthcare system, especially under COVID-19, has undergone unprecedented change and hardship. The one constant above all else is the vital importance of that doctor and nurse patient relationship. To me, being a good doctor or nurse, it takes knowledge, it takes skill for sure, but there's something more important that I've learned with aging 
And as I said last time, Jenny, there are three stages of life. There's youth, there's middle age, and there's you look good. I've entered the you look good stage. Yeah. And what I've learned in all that time, honestly, more important than knowledge and skill, it requires honesty, integrity, a selfless concern for others, a deep sensitivity and compassion for the suffering, touched with a good, strong dose of optimism, humor, and wit. I have always felt, and I feel even stronger today than ever before, it is as important, if not more so, to heal the mind mm -hmm. as it is to heal the body. For when the body is ailing, the mind is ailing as well and needs that comfort and attention too. There's a credo on my desk. Cure if you can. Alleviate if you cannot. But always comfort and support. And never, ever take away hope. Wow. That's powerful. Um, wow. I'm speechless right now. <laughs> so words to live by, you guys. Words to live by. But let's um let's kind of change gears now into our exam and as promised we're going to talk a little bit about cardiac murmur so we kind of got you set up in the right frame of mind to be the most the best version of yourself with your patient right but now let's talk about tips and tricks on exam findings so we're going to specifically focus on cardiac murmurs because dr chisner is an expert <laughs> <laughs> and so just a little bit of a, a breakdown of what we're going to do for the next bit is I wanted to give you guys some can't miss murmurs because there's going to be things that you hear that aren't always going to be groundbreaking, right? And you're, you're going to hear things and they're not going to be important. They can be flow murmurs. They can be, um, you know, grade one murmurs that are really nothing, small murmurs in kids, right? But there's some murmurs that you can't miss and those murmurs a few of them are listed here. So we're going to talk about these one by one, and we're going to do a couple cases. And what we're going to hope that you want to do, and feel free to um, come off mute if you want to join in, but we're going to go over four cases in particular and walk through two minds bantering back and forth, and hopefully yours too, about how you would approach this patient. So without further ado, let's jump into case number one. And before I talk about this case, I need to say that this is not a patient's real face, but this was a real case. So this was a 60 year old male and EMS was called because he passed out while he was walking up the stairs. So he had a murmur that was best heard over the right sternal border in the second intercostal space and it radiated to the right carotid. So let me ask you, Dr. Chisner and folks here on Zoom. Hi, Samantha, hi, Michelle. Um, what do you guys think of and, and cast a wide net, right? Cast a wide net. What are some things that concern you about his history? And what are some things that you would be thinking about as far as your differentials? Would you like me to start? Yeah, let's, let's have you lead the, the pack. So I'm looking at a 60 year old and it's a male, not a female. What am I even thinking about from that alone? If I'm thinking, something coronary land, that's one thing. If I'm thinking something perhaps not in coronary land, I might be thinking that we're dealing with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction because this person had a syncopal episode, passed out with an exertional episode walking up the stairs. And we know that there are three classic symptoms of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, don't we? Exertional chest discomfort, angina, if you will, exertional shortness of breath, and exertional near syncope or syncope, which this patient experienced. And for a male, that would fit, not that you couldn't have it in a woman, but a male, I would be thinking at an older age group, aortic stenosis. Could it be hokum? I would expect it could be, but it could be a younger person. But with aortic valve stenosis, if you're approaching 65 or 70 or older, it's more likely to be a tri-leaflet, wear and tear, degenerative 
fibrocalcification of the valve, whereas if it's a younger male, it might be a bicuspid aortic valve, a congenital anomaly that is the underlying substrate. If I'm thinking left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, and I'm trying to differentiate HOCAM, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which I might be listening for more in the younger person who might be trying out for sports, for a physical, for a sudden death in athletes, for example, since HOCAM is the most common cause of sudden death in the athlete below the age of 30. It would depend on what I would be looking for and listening for. So if I'm hearing a heart murmur at the right sternal border, and I presume it's the right second intercostal space, the aortic area, and I'm listening there, and I hear a murmur. What kind of murmur? A systolic murmur. What kind of configuration? Crescendo, decrescendo, ejection murmur. Now remember, two-thirds of blood leave the left ventricle in the first third of systole. Said differently, most blood is ejected from the heart in the first half of systole when the heart is contracting. If I hear a murmur in systole, first I have to know what systole represents. If I'm over the aortic area, I'll hear the first and second heart sounds, right? And the second sound should be louder than the first. Look, duck, look, duck, look, duck. The first heart sound is created by closure of the mitral and tricuspid valve. The second sound is created by closure of the aortic and pulmonary valve. I'm over the aortic area, so it's going to be A2 or the second sound louder than S1. Anything between lub and dub is during ventricular contraction or systole. So if I hear instead of lub dub, I hear lub dub. That's a murmur, but that murmur is not very intense. That murmur is not very long. That could just be an outflow murmur of aortic sclerosis at this age group. But if I heard a later peaking murmur that was harsh and it peaked, here it says mid systole, but it, it could even peak late systole, like I'm clearing the back of my throat. <sighs> and the murmur travels into the carotids. It could be not just the right carotid, it could actually be both. And that harsh murmur, crescendo, decrescendo, if it's late peaking, and for example, if the carotid upstroke is delayed and small and slow, pulsus parvus et tardis, and as we inch the stethoscope, from the aortic area to the pulmonic, down the left sternal border, to the tricuspid, to the apex. And we hear the murmur is now more musical, Jenny. Mm. 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 That's called a Galavardin phenomenon of severe aortic stenosis. And another pearl or clue, if you listen to the second heart sound and you don't hear it very well at all, it's very hard to hear. <sighs> I don't hear it. That's different than love. It's <sighs> that means the valve is so calcified, fibrotic, it's not moving very much. So the aortic closure will be very hard to hear, faint or even inaudible sometimes even paradoxical splitting because you're delaying, mechanically delaying ejection. But the clues all came from this murmur to the carotids. You might even listen for it as for a gallop at the apex with the bell, belupta, belupta, because the hypertrophied ventricle coming from pressure load from the severe aortic stenosis is causing the atrium to try to force blood against a resistant non-compliant left ventricle to generate the fourth heart sound. If I was dealing with hokum, 
I wouldn't expect to have this murmur louder at the second intercostal space. I would really not expect it typically to radiate into the carotids. I'd expect it to be best heard at the mid left sternal border. And then I would try to understand if I can make that murmur change in intensity because the outflow tract obstruction of hokum is not fixed like aortic stenosis, it's dynamic. It's created by a very thick septum and it's created by one of the mitral leaflets coming closer to the thick septum, the anterior leaflet, and by a method called the Venturi effect creates an outflow obstruction underneath the aortic valve, that's why it's better heard lower down, that can get louder, for example, if the patient stood up and becomes fainter if the patient squatted. And actually, Dr. Harvey had a pearl to diagnose hokum, and he called the cardiac pearl a fact or a finding on taking a history or performing a physical exam that either leads to or makes the diagnosis. Like a pearl, it does not lose its luster over time. It stands the test of time. The value today is the same as it was 50 years ago, as it will be 50 years from now. It will not lose its luster over time. It will stand the test of time because patients will always present with the same symptoms and the same findings for the same reasons that will never change. So what is the pearl to diagnose hokum? You shake hands with the patient and you feel the pulse and you feel a quick rise, flip, 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 a quick rise pulse, number one. Number two, you're thinking, what is the most common cause of a quick rise pulse? Turns out to be aortic regurgitation. So now you're gonna tune in with a stethoscope to listen with the diaphragm piece, preferably at the left sternal border, to a diastolic blowing decrescendo murmur. La -poo. La -poo. of aortic regurgitation. But you don't hear it. Instead, number three, you hear a systolic crescendo, decrescendo murmur at the left sternal border. Lub, dub. Now, number four, you do a maneuver. And the one Dr. Harvey announces is the click, is the squat and stand maneuver where the sound murmur becomes faint with squatting, becomes louder with standing. It's called the one, two, three, four diagnosis of hokum. But this case sounds no pun intended, like aortic stenosis to my ears. Well, I think you're onto something there, but um, I'm, I don't think this, this recorded murmur has anything on what you just gave us. So I'll play it anyway, even though it's gonna be subpar, but we'll just, we'll see what it sounds like. So what do you, what do you think about that? Does that solidify your diagnosis? So what we're trying to determine by listening is to a harsh crescendo, decrescendo, systolic ejection murmur at the right upper sternal border, yes, this would be aortic stenosis. And what a surprise. He did not know the answer to this case before I showed it to him. He's just winging it with us. And of course, he nailed it. But um, as he just pointed out, so elegantly, um, all the differentials. I think a lot of you guys got it right in the chat. So I love that you're playing along and um, really getting to, to get a practice guess in, right? So let's do case number two. So that was aortic stenosis, spot on. And case two is another good one. So um, this was a real case, again, not a real patient's face, but patient was a 48 year old male and he was, I believe on dialysis already. And he came in with some chest discomfort. So he had some shortness of breath, chest discomfort, and his chest pain was worse when they laid him down flat to get the EKG. And every time they laid him flat, he popped back up and would sit in a leaning forward position to get comfort. His murmur was appreciated. Um, 
heard between the apex and the sternum, and it was a loud continuous scratchy murmur. So let's run through our differentials for that. Go ahead and pop them in the chat and um, we'll run it by our consultant. We'll, we'll do a bedside consult here with Dr. Tizer. Wouldn't we be so lucky if we could have that for real? Okay, what, what are your thoughts? So let's go back to the presentation. My chest hurts. So now we have to understand chest pain and the differential diagnosis of chest pain, right? So if we were thinking coronary disease, classically, we might be thinking with exertion, a tightness, a pressure, a squeezing, a heavy feeling in the chest that can go to the jaw or the arm or the both arms with sweating, with shortness of breath. But that's not what this is telling us. In fact, if we did a deeper dive, not only would we understand that the chest pain is worse lying flat, but that it's sharp. It is not that heavy pressure. It can travel to the trapezius ridge or the nuchal fold or to the shoulders. It could be worse when the patient takes a deep breath in, pleuritic type discomfort. It could be worse lying flat, supine. And as Jenny said, better sitting up, leaning forward. That is a classic description of that different source of pain called pericarditis. Now, if it's a dialysis patient, patient may need to intensify his dialysis because of his pericarditis and it's uremia that's creating this problem. Pericarditis has a whole host of differential diagnoses that cause it, right? The most common of which are viral, idiopathic. Might be someone with systemic lupus, a connective tissue disorder. Someone could have had a recent myocardial infarction, transmural, mind you, STEMI, that affected the epi and then pericardium. In fact, I remember a very interesting situation. I was finishing in the cath lab, putting a stent into someone with a STEMI, and the patient did just beautifully, and I went home. And that evening, I get a phone call from Amy, the nurse. Dr. Chisner, I'm so sorry to disturb you, but your patient's having chest pain. You know, the one you just put the stent in? Dr. Chisner, you think something's wrong with the stent? Do you think it could have closed? With half of my eye open at two in the morning, I said, I would hope not, Amy. She says, you think you can come in? I said, okay. So when I arrived, I was finding the patient couldn't lie flat. The patient wanted to sit up. When he breathed in, it hurt him. And then when I took out this forgotten instrument we call a stethoscope to listen, I heard I heard this three component atrial contraction, ventricular contraction, ventricular relaxation. Three component scratchy, squeaky, superficial to the listening ear, whatever description we say pericardial friction rub that oftentimes actually even gets louder with inspiration. The 12 lead EKG as Jenny so beautifully articulates now shows ST elevation with the smiley face diffuse without reciprocal depression, right Jen? Yes. And there's PR segment depression, and the patient has early acute pericarditis because, after all, they had a transmural MI. Even though we opened the, the artery with a stent, the endocardium to myocardium to epicardium to pericardium caused pericarditis. Thank God nothing was wrong with the stent. All the patient needed was anti-inflammatory medicine, which mind you, differs in timing with an infarct because in the early stages of an infarct, 
you might not want to rush to give an NSAID with colchicine because that could impair infarct healing and lead to the possibility of rupture. You might want to use aspirin in lieu of the NSAID and try to restore and recurrence, reduce recurrence with the colchicine. Wow. So, but in this case, it's uremic pericarditis from dialysis. It needs more <laughs> intense dialysis. <laughs> yes, all, the, all of these things, yes. Um, so let's play uh, the murmur and uh, let's see again what it sounds like. It's going to sound exactly like what you just did. All right. So that was pericarditis for sure, spot on. And I think you um, more than more than covered that. Awesome. Thank you. There is a question from Joni, who is a cardiology NP. Joni says, how far do you wait to start your NSAIDs in that situation? Great question, Joni. <clears throat> the literature varies in the description of when you should start. Some people say wait only seven to 10 days before you can start the NSAID. Other people are a little bit stricter and want you to wait up to a month before you can start the NSAID. But as a minimum, seven to 10 days before you would start an NSAID. And remember, you're worried about rupture. And the most common mechanical complications of myocardial infarction, and there are several, right? If you were dealing, for example, with an inferior wall myocardial infarction, which you would know from Jenny teaching you that ST elevation in 2, 3 AVF with reciprocal depression in 1 and AVL. And by the way, if it's higher in lead 3 than in lead 2, more commonly right coronary artery, you're thinking which one of those mechanical complications are more likely with rupture? Well, papillary muscle rupture would be more likely. And then you might listen for a new systolic murmur at the apex, but it may no longer be holosystolic like chronic mitral regurge. It may not be because it's acute mitral regurge. And with acute mitral regurge, the atrium is still small. Pressure quickly rises, but the pressure pushes back on the left ventricle. So it shortens the murmur the murmur may only be heard in early systole or even inaudible. But if it is heard, it's acute mitral regurg that's heard in the early portion of systole, oftentimes accompanied by an S4. That would be the papillary muscle rupture with the inferior wall MI. If it was, let's say, an anterior wall MI, ST elevation in the anterolateral leads, V1 to V6 and 1 in AVL, and then all of a sudden, you heard a holosystolic murmur, harsh at the lower left sternal border, that you may even take the palm of your hand and feel a palpable thrill, and then listen, ventriculous <laughs> septal defect. I remember vividly rounding on a patient third day after we had put a stent in for a STEMI, everything was fine, I went and left the unit only to get called back stat by the nurse saying that same patient that was just reading a newspaper, Jen, was now cold, clammy, diaphoretic, hypotensive, thrashing about in bed. What in the world could have happened? First thing I did, put my hand right here, felt a palpable thrill, listened, heard the acute rupture of the interventricular septum had to put a balloon pump, send the patient emergently to surgery. Mm. And of course, the worst complication of all, oftentimes in a woman, 70 year of age group, delayed presentation to the hospital, hypertensive, all of a sudden starts going into shock. And then you see a rhythm on the electrocardiogram, you have no palpable pulse, you have what we call PEA, pulseless electrical activity. The most common cause is a free wall blowout, free wall rupture. And that's usually a woman in her 70s, first infarction, 
left anterior descending, no collaterals, anterior wall infarction, delayed presentation, hypertensive, unfortunate outcome. Should you be lucky enough to rush to surgery, that would be wonderful, but in other cases, the patient may not make it. So those are the three most common ruptures that we look for post-infarction. Wow, I'm, I, I wish I was taking notes right now. This is amazing stuff. Um, okay, you guys, so we're gonna keep going because um, again, you're just blowing my mind. <laughs> let's do case three, we have, we have four today. So let's do case three and let's talk um, about this next one. Uh, let me go back. So this is case three. Um, this is Betty, not a real patient's face, 68 year old female and Betty is short of breath and she has a cough. So I know all of us right now are thinking, does Betty have COVID? Um, but this was pre COVID so we can rule that out. And she also feels an occasional fluttering in her chest. Now I wanted to just pick your brain Dr. Chisner because I find this isn't written down anywhere but I find that our little elderly ladies often will complain when they have AFib of feeling like bubbles are in their chest or like butterflies are in their chest. Have you heard that as a common theme as well? I have, yes. It's a funny phenomenon because I don't hear men saying that. Um, but another thing that recently I've put together with our little older ladies is that they will often, when they have AFib or new flutter, they'll say they just don't feel right. I feel off and some of them even feel a little bit, um, they mentate differently. They're a little confused when they're in their AFib or flutter, and not having a TIA or a stroke. So um, I, I attribute that to losing your 20% atrial kick potentially, or maybe their blood pressure, they're not perfusing as well. But what, what's your take on that whole situation? Well, I'm so impressed with you, Jen, because what you're demonstrating to everyone is your trained intuitive power of observation. And that's what the masters of medicine years ago had. We've lost all that, unfortunately, today, because we're not even talking to patients like we should. We're not only list, not listening to patients tell us what's wrong, but we could pick up so many things. Women present differently as, than men, 100% true, no question. Um, some of the pearls on this presentation would be female. Before I mentioned male, female, well, it could be a lot of things, right? It could be anything, really coronary disease included, but a female, if I had to hone in on a valve, I'm honed in on the mitral valve. <laughs> Just like in a male, I'm honed in on the aortic valve. And oh, by the way, another pearl, aortic valve, normal sinus rhythm. Not that they can't fibrillate, but aortic valve, normal sinus rhythm. Mitral valve, not so much. Atrial fibrillation, it's closer to the atrium, right? Female mitral valve. Older woman, well, they're not giving us the classic young woman who just immigrated from India, because if we're talking about rheumatic heart disease, which is dramatically declined in the developed countries in our country, right? Thanks to improved housing and access to healthcare and antimicrobial therapy for group A strep and everything else, we have still seen endemic areas could be Asia, Africa, South America, where rheumatic fever is still endemic. And then you have the migrants who come here and then they are discovered here years later, the rheumatic fever may be between ages five and 15, but later on in life is when they present. How do they present? Hmm, they could be short of breath, dyspnea. Cough, hmm, probably a dry cough right? And they're in heart failure. Now, if she was a younger woman, what precipitates that in young women with mitral valve disease? Pregnancy. But in her age group, it's going to be something different. It's going to be the fluttering in her chest. That's the new murmur of atrial fibrillation, which mitral stenotics don't handle so well. They need that atrial kick because their valve aperture, aperture is so small, you can't even get the blood in there. It's going to back up. And then when the atrium quiver and usually go fast, they're gonna go into heart failure. Mm. You've just confirmed it, probably looking at her face, not this one, but you might see a slap cheek sign. I remember walking into the room with the fellows and from the bedside, I looked at this woman sitting there having lunch 
And she looked like in the old days was putting on rouge. <laughs> and I said, they were presenting this as an unknown. I said, she has rheumatic mitral stenosis. And they all looked like, how do you know that? <laughs> well, you're in for the magic trick. When the secret is, she had the clue. She had the pink cheeks and a pallid face of the mitral stenotic facies. The classic sculptatory findings would be the first heart sound, it depends what stage of mitral stenosis. If it's the earlier stages, it's a loudest one, looked up. Then you have the opening snap, looked it up. Then you have the rumble of mitral stenosis, looked it up. And then if she's not fibrillating because you lose the pre-systolic atrial kick, if it was sinus, which she doesn't have, then a pre-systolic accentuation. Looked it up, rupt it up, rupt it up, rupt it up. Otherwise, it's left it up, 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 with the atrial fib. So she has the diastolic murmur at the apex, which is mitral stenosis, best heard in the left lateral decubitus position, taking the bell precisely over that, that area of the apex to listen for the diastolic rumble of mitral stenosis. So this woman had rheumatic fever. She went into AFib. She has mitral stenosis. She has congestive heart failure. And you've, you've hit the bell with the diastolic rumble at the apex. Awesome. Okay, thank you. And I, I wanted to ask you one thing, actually, while we're talking about the mitral valve. So um, when you have patients who are younger and they have you know, a long lineage in their you know, uh, female side of their family with mitral valve prolapse, and they come in really symptomatic, these younger females, like in their 20s, maybe early 30s. And they say, oh, I'm, you know, I have anxiety, I have palpitations, you know, I and, they, and you find on echo, they have a little bit of mitral valve prolapse. And they just have all these, you know, sometimes brain fog, they sometimes just don't feel right. Um, do you have any thoughts on mitral valve prolapse syndrome? Is it a real thing? Great question. So the answer is it's most definitely a real thing, but we have to understand what we're saying. And it gets back to a few very basic adages. Number one, causation is not the same as association. Very important difference. Very important difference. If um, more sheep die on day one and more ice cream is sold at whatever store I'm not promoting, if I close the ice cream store, Will I affect the sheep that passed away? And the answer is, of course, no. Because what caused both phenomenon to occur was that it was 110 degrees that day. So more people wanted ice cream, but more sheep got dehydrated. So association and causation are not the same. What you're describing, Jenny, is something we call dysautonomia. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. no. Yes. Autonomic dysfunction. And without exaggeration, I see this a half a dozen times on a daily basis, not just in young girls with mitral valve prolapse syndrome, just in general. And I've seen it even more so now post COVID. Me too. Yep. Lots of, I feel like there's lots more pots. Lots of everything. Yes. Yeah. So to explain to the audience, the classic prototypical patient with mitral valve prolapse syndrome. And if you look at the, the original books for the lay people, there is a books on coping with mitral valve prolapse. There'll be a chapter on dysautonomia in there. Mm. So these young people are in their young 20s, their young 30s. They could be other ages, of course. They're very anxious, panic stricken. They have chest pain, but it's very atypical chest pain. They have shortness of breath, but it's not if they can't get a good deep breath, they get rapid accelerated heart rates of POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. They could be getting lightheaded, dizzy, and passing out with neurocardiogenic syncope or vasovagal syncope. And classically, look at them. They're slender. They have supple joints, high arch palate, little pectus excavatum, straight back hypomastia, you listen, and they may have, as you inch, looked up, looked up. Now you're down to the left sternal border. All of a sudden you hear, looked up, looked up, looked up, looked 
looked up with the cadence of look it up, 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 look it, it, it up. And there are a few things when you're doing bedside skills. Number one, have an orderly approach, like the inching technique we're going over. The other is mimicry. I think mimicry is very important. Just like I said before, if we have an innocent murmur, which means it's not guilty, if you want to mimic an innocent murmur, take the word H-U-H and put it between love and dub. Love, dub. Love, dub. Go ahead. Go ahead. Love. love. Perfect. You have an innocent murmur. Everything else is normal. The pulse is a normal, pressure is normal, venous pulse is a normal, recordium is normal, no other adverse sounds, no clicks, no gallops, no other murmurs, nothing. This is an innocent systolic murmur. You do not have to get an echo to prove you as the clinician is correct. In fact, on the board exam, the answer is do not get the echo, reassure your patient. But once you start having extra sounds like the click, lup, dub, might have two clicks, lup, dub, lup, dub, might be like a deck of cards, a series of clicks, lup, 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 lup. might be a click mid to late systolic murmur, lup, 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 or a hoop, like whooping cough, lup, hoop, lup, hoop, lup, hoop or a honk like a goose, but the honk. These are the escultatory variants, the music, if you will, of the heart of mitral valve prolapse. And the syndrome really is dysautonomia associated with mitral valve prolapse. The misunderstanding is someone saying, gee, my doctor told me my mitral valve prolapse is acting up. Mm -hmm. There's no mitral valve prolapse acting up. This person could have a non, no condition. It's like I always say, uh, the yellow sun in a blue sky with a cumulus nimbus cloud. It means nothing. They could just have the click or the murmur and it will never change. They'll never ever need mitral valve repair or anything or a clip or anything. They have the dysautonomia. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, it did. I'm, I'm glad to hear your take on it because a lot of folks don't really put much stock into it. but. Um... Did you did you write a section on that in your book? I have examples of it, but I, at this point, uh, maybe another time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Um, I'm just trying to remember where I learned it. I'm, it's got to be from you. Okay, so let's do one more case, guys, and then we'll wrap up this awesome lecture. But we'll do case number four, who is um, a 21-year-old male who was running on the track and had chest discomfort and a near syncopal episode. So... Um, he had 911 called. He felt better after he sat down. Um, medics arrived on scene. And being a former medic, I can almost picture myself on this same call. And it's hard to convince a 21 year old male who says, I'm just overtraining to go to the hospital. So, luckily, they had some crafty EMS folks on scene who said, Let's get you to the hospital. Let's get you checked out. Yes, it's hot outside. You could be dehydrated. Yes, <laughs> you could have been overtraining, but let's just go check you out. So uh, he goes to the hospital, they get a quick chest x-ray, which is normal. They do labs, all normal. They give him an IV, normal saline, 1000 cc bolus. He feels better. And he says, you know, I think I just wanna go home. But of course they do an EKG, which I will show you. But let's talk about the differentials for this, especially in the setting of what you're gonna hear here. Okay, and that actually got softer when he was squatting, hint, hint. So <laughs> what are your thoughts on this case? Lacey already said, has a guess. She thinks this is hokum. What are your thoughts, Dr. Tisner? Lacey is absolutely correct. That was great. So let's look at the whole thing. Again, young, 20-year-old male. Okay, I'm thinking young male, and when did this chest discomfort and near syncopal episode happen? During running, during the exertion. I'm back to 
exertional symptom of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And that young age could be a bicuspid aortic valve, it's possible, but I'm worried more about hope. I could have found out later on that his relative suddenly had, quote, a heart attack and died at a young age, it's possible, but I'd be more concerned with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So what would I do? I would try to do the one, two, three, four diagnosis to see if that's true. And I would shake hands and I would feel the radial pulse and I would determine if there's a quick rise. And then I would listen, number two, for aortic regurgitation, but I don't hear it. Number three, I hear the systolic crescendo, decrescendo at the left sternal border. And then I would do a maneuver. If I squat the patient, the murmur gets faint or goes away. If I stand the patient, it gets louder. If the patient can't squat and stand for whatever reason, you can bend their knees to their chest, or you can even have them do a Valsalva maneuver where they take your finger in your mouth, purse your lips and blow hard. Don't let the air out. And the murmur will get louder. Or I can do isometric hand grip and the murmur will get fainter because you're increasing afterload resistance. You're putting more blood into a larger left ventricular cavity. You're removing the obstruction. I remember a very interesting case, Jen. May I share it? Please. So this is a true story. They're all true stories. They're not fabricated. It's not inspired by a true story. It's a real <laughs> story. I was making rounds a long time ago at Broward and um, a patient comes in, not my patient, with chest pain. And the attending was there and I'm making rounds most of the afternoon on a Saturday. And I'm hanging around just in case I would get called in consult. But as luck wouldn't have it, I didn't. So I left. At seven o'clock in the evening after I was now about to go out for dinner, the stacked phone call consult comes in. Dr. Chisner, we need an emergency balloon pump and cath. This patient now is in shock. Oof. I wish they had called a few hours ago. I come back into the hospital and uh, what do I witness? The patient, the attending is still there, God bless him. He's been with the patient all day long, Jenny. That's amazing. Yeah. Second of all, the patient is lying there on, this, on the bed in a coma. has a Foley catheter with not one drop of urine in it. Blood pressure is in the 80 systolic range. Heart rate's in the 120 range. And there are three IV drips running. First one is nitroglycerin at 200 mics. Then is dopamine and then dobutamine. All three are running. I look at this patient in shock. And I have the EKG on the stretcher next to him. I look at it and it's got prominent voltage and very slender Q waves, deep Q waves in 2, 3, AVF, B5 and B6. Jenny's smiling because she knows already. I decide I can't take a history. <laughs> I'll listen. I listen at the left sternal border, I hear I looked at the attending, I said, did he have a heart murmur like this all day? He said, actually, no, Mike. When he first came in, I heard no heart murmur. I said, would you listen now? He listens, he goes, wow, it wasn't there earlier. I said, it wasn't there earlier, how interesting. Well, what could it be? Was that an infarct we saw with the Q waves and 2, 3, AVF, E5, and V6? Did the patient just have what we talked about a few minutes ago, a rupture, papillary muscle rupture of MR, or a VSD rupture where it was louder at the left sternal border? I said, nah, but according to Jenny, that doesn't look like a STEMI to me. I don't feel it really fits. I said, hmm. I wonder, I remember Jenny once taught me something else, maybe. So I turned to the nurse, I said, would you do me a favor? 
would you turn off the nitroglycerin drip? She looks at me, she says, Dr. Chisner, this patient came in with chest pain. We started him at 10 mics and we've been working up on the nitro all day. You sure you want me to turn it off? I said, well, he's not doing so wonderful. I said, we're here. I'm just curious to see what would happen. So she reluctantly turns it off. Then she looks at me and I said, she says, you're gonna take him to the cat lab? I said, yeah, but just, would you do me a favor? Would you turn off the dopamine drip too? She looks at me, she said, but his blood pressure is 80. I said, I know, but I'm just curious about something. <laughs> would you turn it off? She looks at me and she's, I said, and oh, by the way, would you turn off the dobutamine drip too? She thinks something happened to me. <laughs> she turns off all three drips. And then I turn to the head nurse. I said, would you get me an Esmolol drip? An ultra short acting beta blocker intravenous. Comes up on the pixel. We start the Esmolol. Everything else is off. And this is what I personally observed. Watch, I'm the patient. Where am I? Where am I? He wakes up, blood pressure goes above 100, heart rate goes below 100, urine starts to flow in the Foley catheter, and the piece de resistance, I take out my stethoscope and listen, and I only heard lucked up looked up. The murmur went away. As it turned out, the patient had Holcomb all along, and we were so-called killing him with kindness by giving him nitro to reduce the preload, and inotropes, we made the dynamic outflow tract obstruction worse that cut off blood flow to his brain and his kidneys and his body, and he went into shock. When we took away all the offending agents, gave him the beta blocker and the fluid, hydrated him up, everything went away. I ended up cathing him that night because that wasn't good enough. And he had normal coronaries and he had hook. Wow. Fantastic story. <laughs> That's so amazing. Wow. Then we was lucky you were there. You saved him. You completely saved him. Kenny, the interesting thing is he turned out in retrospect to have had a history of hypertension. And in those days, he had run out of his meds five days ago. And the med he ran out of was 320 milligrams of a beta blocker. Oh, that was, wow. was masking all the time his whole thing. Wow. That yeah. That's a good story. Your stories are always amazing. <laughs> well, guys, um, I just want to really quickly thank Dr. Tisner for coming on today and give you a quick chance. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat um, because this is a rare moment to get to pick such an amazing brain like his. Um, but if you don't have any questions now and you think of something later, let me know. I can always relay them to him. But Dr. Tisner, thank you for taking your time on a very busy day to teach um, some young new minds just some of what you know. And um, a lot of people are saying thank you as well. We're hoping that you'll come back some other time to share more wisdom. Uh, first of all, I want to share with everyone how blessed and fortunate you all are to have someone so wonderful as Jenny, as your educator and your mentor. I think she, what she's doing for you is just absolutely phenomenal. And um, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to come back and be with everyone this afternoon.